have uh, three guests and three panelists who, who have a, a large amount of experience in their fields. Uh, first of all is uh, Roshini Prakash from AVPN. She's the Knowledge Director. She's connecting from Singapore. We also have Jessica, who is the Brand and Partnerships Manager at uh, MPI. Uh, she's based in Shanghai. And finally, we have uh, David Moreno from Arca Continental, and he's based in, uh, in Monterrey. Uh, AM, AVPN is our sister network in Asia. MPI is the case study of the report we're launching today. And David is a member of Arca Continental, one of our founding members of Latin Pacto. Um, we, will, we would like also to, to thanks, of course, Jessica and Roshini from being here. Uh, I know it's quite late as well in Singapore and in China. So thank you very much for taking the time. We truly appreciate all the work that, that AVPN uh, has done to, to support Latin Pacto in its growth share with you some house rules. The first one is listen carefully and speak with intention. The second one is try to have your microphones off if you're not speaking. Uh, the third one is try to put your name and the name of your organization in your Zoom profile. Uh, if you don't know how, please uh, ask Lina and she can provide all the details. Uh, the fourth one is please have an active participation but be respectful of, of others' time. And the, the fifth one is to use your chat, use the chat to share your ideas and ask questions while someone else is speaking. That is very welcoming. And finally, please keep your cameras on. That gives us a, a more um, community vibe. So thank you very much. Uh, and now I just want to let you know about the objectives we have for today. The first one is to present the report AVPN launched in 2020 about the role of intermediaries maximizing corporate social impact. We are very happy to have this report translated to Spanish and Portuguese, and it will be available on our webpage for download. Thank you very much, AVPN, for allowing us to do this. And the second one, uh, I think, is to introduce and discuss how intermediaries complement and maximize the impact strategies of corporates through their knowledge, their expertise in the social sector, and of course, their vast, their vast networks. And now one of the questions we, 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 we were made while, while translating this report is, why is a report about a case study in China important for Latin American corporates and intermediaries? The first one is uh, corporate social impact as analyzed by in the report goes beyond right now uh, from traditional CSR practices and is aligning to the ever increasing demands from stakeholders to support initiatives that not only offset negative impact, but also create positive long-term impact that is aligned to the values and missions of the corporates. The second one is there is a pressing need and interest from many corporates to combine their core business strategy with their impact strategy. However, as expertise goes, their need for organizations that understand the impact landscape and have developed networks of social purpose organizations extensively or that can manage urgent needs from communities where the corporates aim to achieve impact is much needed for this task. Uh, it is here that field building intermediaries like MPI become essential to the strategy of the corporate. And third, when we ask ourselves, why does a report from China has relevance for the Latin American public, especially corporates and intermediaries? The answer is quite simple and of course will be provided with the intervention of Roshini and Jessica. But more importantly, uh, it is uh, certain that corporates in China and in most of Asia, they have begun to ask themselves how can they support the communities and the issues that are important for their consumers through their core business, or at least how can they align their impact strategy to their corporate vision. Uh, second, you can say that several of the challenges that corporates are facing today are common to every region, not only Asia, not only Latin America, not only Europe. Uh, there's so, some things such as the unpreparedness in terms of developing impact strategies for C-level executives, aligning the different areas on the same theory of change, understanding the problems such as are, are we treating a root cause or are we treating just a symptom of something larger, and finally, it takes too long for to make partnerships or network uh, with social purpose organizations or even social enterprises based on different things. For example, uh, corporates and social purpose organizations have a different vision. One has a social one and the other one has a, a, an economic one. Or for example, the corporates don't, and social enterprises don't really get along on how can they be included in their value chain so that they cannot treat social enterprises under the same lens that they treat the rest of their value chain. 
Also, uh, it is not only companies in Europe or in the United States that have found that driving positive social and environmental impact can have positive effects for their consumers, for their employees, for their shareholders and the business in general. Uh, different businesses from the smallest one to the larger corporation all around the world have found that driving this um, that driving impact through corporations have the potential to become sustainable, scalable, and with patience having a reinforcing effect on the profit margins. So it's a really good investment op opportunity. Um, I hope that today with our panelists um, is what our panelists are going to share is enriching for all of you. Uh, we at Latin Impacto are proud of building these bridges between regions and experiences. Uh, and this is what we aim for with our partnership with our sister network in Asia and Latin America. And finally, allow me to say that uh, this conversation uh, aligns with our corporate impact initiative. Uh, we're here, we're here to, to support corporates and the corporate social vehicles such as corporate foundations, corporate incubators, corporate impact funds, etc., in their impact journey. Uh, so they can become more strategic and aligned with their theory of change and their vision for the future they want these societies to live in. So thank you very much. And I'll give right now the floor to Roshini. Uh, Roshini, please, the floor is yours. So you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Andave. Just give me a moment to share my screen and then I'll get started. Okay, I hope that works. It does. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Juan David. Thank you, um, Carolina, the Latin Pacto team, for having me here today. I think that, uh, Juan David, you said it very well that there are a lot of things that are similar between Asia, Latin America, Europe, actually globally in the way that corporates operate and the way they're thinking about their social impact footprint. Um, and I hope that uh, through this case study, you will see that actually corporates don't do it alone when they have solid partners on the ground, such as um, intermediaries, they can extend their footprint even further. But before I get into the report, let me share a little bit about AVPN, who we are. Uh, we are a very proud older sister uh, to Latin Pacto. Um, we're headquartered in Singapore, uh, but we have representatives in 12 markets across Asia Pacific. Uh, this is our 10th year anniversary, so we're 10 years old, uh, going into double digits. Uh, so as any child knows, this is a big deal. Um, but we're also very proud that we have over 600 uh, funders and resource providers in our membership, and they sit across 32 markets. I said that we are an Asia Pacific a membership network, but 20% of our members sit outside the region and they invest into it. Uh, similar to Latin Pacto, our mission is to move capital towards impact uh, pro by providing opportunities for our members to connect with key stakeholders across various sectors and markets to learn from one another and then to find opportunities for action. Um, my title is Knowledge Director. Um, I lead the Knowledge and Insights team and it sits within our products pillar at AVPN. And our role is really to support our members with research, best practice on a range of social investment topics and themes. Uh, so why did we write this report? We wrote this case study last year, actually, when the pandemic was just emerging. But even before this, um, this happened, it was already clear from the conversations that we we're having with our corporate members that they were reconsidering their role in the community and society. They wanted to push boundaries, like what you said, Juan David, to move beyond traditional CSR, right? Activities that were ad hoc or project-based arrangements to explore models of giving that were longer term, more strategic, more sustainable, and most critically, collaborative. But they were very, having a few challenges navigating this landscape. At the same time, we were seeing within our membership the ways in which intermediaries had been able to bridge gaps and to help corporates in different markets address some of the challenges. A lot of corporates work across markets. And so getting to understand the local context and local situation in each market that they were in was taking time. But with intermediary support, uh, they had access to specialist knowledge and they had access to local connections across the ecosystem. So in this case study, we use the example of one intermediary, actually the most important intermediary um, in China, 
and PI to demonstrate how these connections, these partnerships between companies and intermediaries can help organizations of different sizes experience and exposure extend their impact footprint. You will hear um, from Jessica later, but you'll also see in the case that MPI is the biggest and best known intermediary and has built up its expertise over the last almost 16 years now. Part of this has been its own proactive ability to spot gaps in the ecosystem. The other part has been the support that MPI itself has received from corporate and government partners to grow its range of service offerings in anticipation of future needs. So when you think about this case and when you read through it, please think about your own markets and who are the partners on the ground that help you make the connections that you are looking for, who could work with you as an intermediary to further your own impact as a corporate, but also whom you could support so that together your own local ecosystem could grow. Um, let me start by telling you some of the challenges that companies in Asia Pacific have been facing or have, been, have told us about in achieving the social impact they desire. So some of these may be familiar to you, you as well. There are four common challenges. One, the trust deficit. Two, the perceived bias in the CSR implementation. Um, third, the lack of strategic planning. And four, the neglect of capacity building as part of the strategic CSR process. Um, taking them in turn, the trust deficit. Um, I think many of you would be familiar with this. As a company and as a nonprofit, you have different interests that you are trying to address. Companies need to consider how to maximize shareholder value. Nonprofits are looking at maximizing the stakeholder or beneficiary value. Your starting point is different. So sometimes there can be a lack of understanding about each other's intentions. Nonprofits sometimes question whether a specific corporate CSR program prioritizes the beneficiaries in the same way that the nonprofit does, or whether the corporate is more concerned with public relations or brand value creation. The bias in CSR implementation, on the other hand, is about projects that um, companies seem to be supporting more than others, primarily because these projects meet the company's due diligence criteria as well as alongside the CSR objectives. Often this means that more well-established nonprofits are getting more funding rather than smaller or newer um, NGOs because there is a certain scale of operations that um, is required to demonstrate um, a track record, a capacity to measure impact and establish organizational structure, all of which the company is looking at as a proxy for the robustness of the organization. A third, lack of strategic planning and CSR, as I mentioned. A lot of corporates are keen to contribute to social issues, but they're not familiar with the sphere. It's not part of their cooperation, core operations, and so they lack the experience to identify the right projects or develop the theory of change uh, that Juan David, you were talking about before. And the last one is about capacity building as part of strategic CSR. Funding tends to be program-based. Nowadays, more companies in, in Asia are thinking about impact and outcomes. All of this is really good. But companies here and perhaps globally as well are not really thinking about uh, capacity building of nonprofits themselves. Uh, for today's projects, that's okay. But when we look down the road, we look at 5, 10, 15 years in the future, if companies don't help nonprofits build their own capacity, their technical expertise, their operational expertise, the way they do their administration, the physical assets that they have, these nonprofits will not be able to achieve the desired programmatic impact. So this is a critical cons consideration and it's a challenge for nonprofits themselves when they are uh, regularly receiving program funding and not operational funding. So what do intermediaries do? Intermediaries, as the name suggests, are actually uh, organizations that connect right? Connect two or three parties. And so they are therefore able to address all the gaps that I mentioned. They can, they are the conduit that facilitate collaboration. They bridge the gap in objectives, they build alignment, they grow trust across the ecosystem between the companies, the social purpose organizations, the nonprofits and the public sector. They can ground activities that companies and nonprofits are working on in a coherent framework that aligns with the company's core business values, but also a nonprofit's objectives. And they can co-create programs that have local relevance. 
that facilitate community building and integration. And all, all this while mobilizing their own networks of capital, knowledge, and capabilities to strengthen the ecosystem overall. Now, I talked about intermediaries really broadly, and that's really because intermediaries come in all shapes and sizes, and they can include incubators, accelerators, and capacity builders. These are organizations that provide the facilities, expertise, and other forms of non-monetary support to entrepreneurs. They can be networks and platforms like AVPN and Latifacto. Uh, these are online and offline locations that convene stakeholders, or they could be research and knowledge providers. They could be academic institutions and organizations that publish insights and thought pieces on, on the development of the social economy. There are a few logos here to represent some of the intermediaries that may be familiar to you, that they uh, operate in locations broader than Asia Pacific, but I want to highlight that each of them actually provides a combination of the services that I, I outlined before. There are also many, many more that I've not mentioned that are equally important in the ecosystem. Things like consulting firms, impact advisory firms, think tanks. Having said that, uh, who is MPI? And what, have, what do they do? They were the core focus of the case study. So uh, I will say a few words about them. Uh, and then Jessica, you can please take it forward and bring us up to speed on present day activities. NPI was the first nonprofit incubator established in China, established in 2006. And as I mentioned before, it is now the best known. Um, it is an intermediary that specializes in providing a range of support services to nonprofits, to government bodies, companies, and social investors. It has now become an umbrella organization with multiple entities and independent sub-business groups within its portfolio. Its presence is across China, uh, in particular in the key cities of Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, and Chengdu. Um, on its own, it has the capacity to reach over 2,000 communities directly, but through its regional hub organizations, it can reach more than double that. Over the years, MPI has forged strong partnerships with companies and the government. So now more than 60% of its funding comes from the business sector and 40% from government contracts. This points to the value that MPI has been able to provide to its corporate partners over time. Many of them have worked with MPI for more than three years, which is very rare in China. HSBC and Ford Motor, for example, they've collaborated with MPI for over eight years. What I wanted to highlight um, here is really what distinguishes MPI, and that is its dedication to continued innovation and adaptation. It responds very quickly to the evolving needs of the social impact ecosystem in, in China, and this can be seen in its growth trajectory. Today, it has both the breadth in access and depth in service, which means that it can effectively support all forms of engagement in this space. So how do corporates work with MPI? So it goes without saying that companies work with MPI in several different ways to develop their social impact strategy, aligning the local needs with company values, not just for immediate purposes, but also over the long term, to support social purpose organizations and nonprofits with financial and non-financial resources, and to help them become more financially sustainable through brokering relationships with other companies and the government for follow-on funding, to build alignment across sectors by helping to craft programs that address the needs of all parties and also to help corporates increase their visibility, to demonstrate their value and to help promote, um, through example, impactful best practices for the public at large. I think uh, this is probably best explained with an example. And in the report, we cover this in a little bit of detail, but in summary, let me talk a little bit about NPI's partnership with Ford Motor on Operation Better World. And this is Ford Motors Global CSR Initiative. The partnership began in 2012. It went through a pivot six years later in 2018. And by 2019, the Operation Better World in China had supported 443 environmental organizations and individuals with grants that exceeded 4 million US dollars. In addition, Operation Better World had provided over 5,000 hours of capacity building services for over 560 organizations. 
more than 14,000 employees and families had contributed over 60,000 hours of volunteer service. As part of the partnership with Ford Motor, NPI helped create and operate the website, a WeChat public account and a database, specifically to increase public awareness of the CSR program. There were also roadshows, public conferences and other events that NPI held in order to raise Ford's visibility. So the impact of this partnership was not just in terms of the depth of activity was also a range of services provided, the number of organizations and individuals supported, as well as the best practice example that was demonstrated across China. I encourage you to read the case study to learn more about this partnership. Um, I know you're looking forward to hearing directly from uh, Jessica and David. So let me quickly speak about uh, what happened post pandemic because our report covered the pre and the post pandemic period um, before I end my presentation and turn it over to them to talk about what's happened in recent years. So within four weeks of the lockdown in Wuhan, NPI co-founded the Community Against COVID-19 Alliance, along with several corporate foundations and institutional partners. These included HSBC uh, through their Community Partnership Program, Lenovo Foundation and Vanke Foundation. The Alliance was able to raise 182,000 US dollars to support 33 local projects that address the needs of all the vulnerable the elderly, the children, the women, the disabled, the poor, through all of whom were suffering acutely. Um, and they did this through community service, social work and volunteering. And, and then by April 2020, the alliance was formalized as the China Community Catalyst. And this, was, this had a goal to empower frontline community workers and vulnerable populations by proactively pooling cross-sectoral resources. And the idea was to establish a long-term and systematic community resilience mechanism. And Jessica can tell us a little bit more about this later, perhaps. Uh, the CCC was also supporting an online learning and capacity building platform for frontline workers, practitioners, and educators to acquire knowledge and skills in building community resilience. Uh, in the case, you will read about two specific partnerships, one with Lendlease China and the other one with DBS Bank at the height of the pandemic, and how that through their partnership with NPI, they were very quickly able to bring resources together, leverage the local communities on the ground and extend the reach of the distribution so as to support those that were most in need. So I'll urge, I urge you to read through those examples closely to better understand how these partnerships may apply in your own context. Um, so that very quickly brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I wanted to highlight at this point, uh, the small microsite that we have at AVPN that uh, has different examples of what uh, companies in our membership are doing to extend their corporate social impact. That's uh, corporate.avpn.asia. Um, we are also working on a new learning center within the AVPN Academy on corporate social impact. This will have a series of self-paced modules that provide on-demand learning as well as live virtual classes for peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, I hope you will take some time to look through these sites and maybe you'll be able to find relevance with the work that you're currently doing in Latin America. Um, and perhaps there will be ways in which we at Latin Pacto and AVPN can connect you with the different companies so that you can learn more directly. Uh, so uh, at this point, let me just say thank you again to the Latin Pacto team for putting this session together and inviting us to participate. I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roshini. And I do expect and hope for, for the same kind of, of collaboration and an and exchange between our, our corporate members and your corporate members. And, um, and if you, our assistants know, we're still working on a corporate impact strategy with our sister networks as well, with AVPN, with DVPA, where we uh, hope to strengthen the impact journey and strategy of our members. Um, so before I give way to, to our next speaker, who is going to be uh, David at Arca Continental, uh, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, our upcoming 
uh, events. Uh, so Lena, can you help me project them? Yes, just a minute. Uh, but we're going to have some amazing things, some in partnership as well with, with an intermediary that uh, Shini that, um, um, mentioned, which is uh, Dahlberg. Uh, but first of all, let me tell you about uh, the publication we're going to launch. Next, previous slide, thank you. Uh, which is um, the, the the report that um, that Roshini just introduced it has been translated to Spanish and to Portuguese. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, David, can you start, please, uh, your presentation? Thank you very much. Yes, please let me know if you can see uh, my screen. Perfect, David. Go ahead. Fantastic. And don't worry, Juan David, uh, is, everyone is happening for the same thing. Uh, we are our homes and it's, it's very quite normal. So um, I just start, uh, want to start, thank you, Carolina, Cher, Juan David, and the uh, Latin Pacto team for this invitation. And as well, it's a pleasure to uh, share this space with Roshini and Jessica. Um, and this is a very, very exciting topic. So again, my name is David Moreno. I'm um, a Corporate Sustainability Manager for Arca Continental. And today I'm going to be sharing a little bit about our experience, uh, the journey that we, uh, in which we are right now uh, related to, to impact and how to connect the impact with business. So. Um, Rather than focus on our specific projects, I will uh, go through this through this um, uh, journey that we are uh, transiting right now. Uh, some context about Arca Continental that will provide um, um, a better idea of what are the challenges that we are facing. We are a food and beverage company uh, in five countries uh, from Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, and the United States. Um, we are one of the biggest Coca-Cola co uh, Coca company bottlers. Uh, we sell the beverage of the Coca-Cola company, but as well, we have some uh, businesses related to snacks, uh, bocados in Mexico, uh, in Alexa in Ecuador, and Wise and Deep River in the United States. We are near to six, um, 4,000 associates, so that will provide kind of a context of the company. Uh, Moving ahead, uh, so we start this this um, discussion internally about how can we create more meaningful and lasting impact inside the organization. And we have been investing uh, through the years uh, a lot of a lot of money, a lot of efforts in trying to be a more uh, more sustainable company uh, across all the topics that are key for us, but. Um, Part of our uh, CSR strategy still remains um, more close to a philanthropic approach than rather than an impact approach. So the questions that and, and the things that we start to notice is that uh, we want to move from this more traditional approach to more uh, uh, to a more uh, impact approach, and moving from, for example, a site program that uh, sometimes is could be understood. Uh, internally in in, um, in some organizations that certain activities are just a program rather a part of the strategy so we want to move to understand CSR as a side program and uh, move to uh, being a part of the strategy uh, moving from measure results to measure impact from uh, trying to solve um, symptoms or, of a specific challenge to start solving the root causes uh, from traditional analysis that we perform to a more uh, portfolio optimization oriented analysis. And um, the list goes, right? Uh, try to, to move from um, the request of support that we receive as a, as a company in, with presence in five countries to a more intended search of partners. Uh, long-term programs, focus on debt, and of course, reduce risk and create opportunities. So for us, that was kind of the trigger. We reviewed the programs that we have 
and we start seeing, well, we need to make sure in some of them we have more maturity, but some of them there is still a space to improve. And that was uh, the beginning of this journey. And we have, I think, more questions than answers right now, but I think this is uh, as well very useful. And I want to exemplify this, this idea of how we are trying to connect um, this, this part of the impact. There, there is a lot of concepts and words on sustainability, uh, ESG, CSR, uh, venture philanthropy. Th there is a lot of information out there and sometimes it's difficult to make sense and organize exactly where you are and how you connect this to, to your core business. And we try to do this with this, with this image. Uh, where at the center of this this um, this graph, we can say that is um, more close to individual um, solutions or individual challenges, the, the 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 individual perspective. And if we move to the uh, horizontal axis, we we will move to find system solutions and the vertical axis uh, challenges at the system level. So if we are close. To the, to the center of this, this image, we'll find traditional business, uh, making traditional investments. Uh, if we start to moving away from what seems to be the core uh, of the business, uh, or at least it's understood like you are moving away of the traditional business, you start uh, identify that you can have business with sustainable practices, investing in this kind of, of practices but at the edge of that, that space, um, for us, the, the definition that we want to reach is to be a sustainable business. And, and then there is a question that we have, well, in what kind of investment or what is the kind of investments that we need to do to, to reach that level? A level where when we face a problem that is so complex or seems to be far from the organization, but is still uh, creating a lot of impact on, on the company, what are the kinds of things that we need to do and, and the things that we need to invest? And I will provide an example in a moment about this. But um, so this kind of questions of how to reach this sustainable business uh, space raise some specific uh, concerns about what is the challenge that we are trying to overcome uh, how is it connected to business? What is the goal that we are trying to reach? And who should be involved? Who's coordinating this kind of efforts? So I'm going to move to the, to the example because I, I think it's easier to explain, but this is a, a specific example of the water topic. Um, water is one of our key ingredients or main inputs for the industry being a beverage and, and food uh, company. And in the right, in the left side uh, on the great boxes, there is a story of all the things that we have been investing through the years, starting at the beginning with internal efficiency, fence scene of our organization, then moving to our value chain, that is uh, the next year of influence that we could reach. And with time, we start investing in nature, protecting the water source, protecting, providing water access to the communities, and and creating this um, continuum of investing in, uh, investments that we do on water. At some point, we realize that we could be one of the companies with the best practices in water uh, sustainability, but still, at the end. Um, we are not reaching a sustainable business. Why? Because our context is not sustainable. So by definition, we cannot be a sustainable company. That's why I was showing the previous slide of we can be sustain again, business with sustainable practices. But at the end, if you are not solving uh, challenges that are um, at the system level with system solutions, you are still not managing your context. So. The last part that is how can we reach this, this system, right? If we are part of a city or a watershed and what we are just one of thousands of the stakeholders um, consuming water in that region, even if we provide 
offset in, in a lot of different practices on, on water if everybody on that watershed or in that city is not working towards the same vision of water security or water sustainability again we are not going to be a company that can be uh that can be sustainable so this is kind of uh the 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 journey that we are trying to to um, uh to understand better just to to have a, a, a better understanding on how we can face this kind of of challenges and once we reach this part of the context how can we manage the context uh we very quickly realized that we need a backbone organization supporting this kind of efforts why because the challenge is, is so big and so complex that we don't have the whole knowledge and capacity inside the organization to face this kind of things we need to to have partnerships that understand very well the topics in a technical side but as well uh, on a more human side the connection on with the communities understanding how we can create a real and more meaningful impact and the coordination is not always uh something that you can perform with a uh, uh, um very, very easily so the backbone is structured what it provides is um, an organization that can put together all the perspective without having any bias, just want to solve a specific problem, and then try to, to move that collective solution that you need to reach. Why it needs to be collective? Again, uh, if the problem is so big, uh, for this case, uh, for example, the, the water issue, there is no money on the organization that is going to be enough to invest at this level or to reach this the scale that is needed um, one of the things that we start doing specifically on water was uh, to try to to work with collective actions organizations we have a couple of examples in mexico uh, in monterrey and in ecuador uh, working in this, this direction but at the end uh, it doesn't matter what is the topic we are seeing and understanding that are um a level of engagement that we need to reach that currently is not uh, being um, done th that way or by design in the organization. We have kind of initiatives that have that maturity, but right now we are trying to make this in a more systematic way, in a more organized way. Uh, it doesn't matter what is the topic. If this, this is emissions or packaging, there is a space where there is a, still a need of investments and if that is not correctly explained it seems like it's too far from your core business and probably that is one of the first challenges that we face um trying to explain this internally when you are talking about uh, for uh, again uh, on water about water governance or um or, or the 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 uh, how financial uh, so financially sustainable is the water sector it seems like it's too far from your business, but that is because there is a gap on the understanding in how to do it. Uh, and that gap is is uh, what could connect and make sense with your uh, CSR strategy, strategy with the sustainability strategy at the end with your business strategy. So uh, that is what I want to share with you today, guys. Um, thank you again for the space and looking forward for the conversation. David, thank you very much. And I think it's very interesting what you're currently doing at Arca Continental. And I hope you can inspire, can inspire more, 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 more to, to redesign and redefine their impact strategy towards a more collective way. Uh, what you mentioned at the end that uh, no problem has only one, needs the solution of only one organization, but it's actually collective work is really important for corporates to understand. And not only for corporates, but for all the impact ecosystem. The, the more we work together, the more we can achieve. Uh, and uh, once again, th uh, sorry about uh, what just happened earlier. Uh, you know, no matter how much you plan about something and about a meeting, uh, something's gonna come in the way. So I'm really sorry about that. And I was mentioning that we're about to launch the translations of the report Rashin introduced. 
uh, to to our web page. It's going. It's been translated to Spanish and to Portuguese, so you can download it for free. There's no problem, and hope you read it, and I hope you enjoy it and get some really nice insights about how intermediaries and corporates are working together to achieve impact. And in a in an ecosystem that might sound foreign to us, like China, but where the learnings can be very much applicable here in Latin America. Uh, and finally, once again, we want to share our upcoming events. The, the first one is uh, our virtual coffee uh, in partnership with, with EDIS on the 21st of October. You can find more information on our webpage or on our social media. Uh, we're going to have three really nice panelists. They come as well from the corporate foundations world. Uh, first is Juliana Ortega from Raya Dro Brasil, uh, João Machado from uh, Fundacion Ageas, and Lina Maria Montoya, who is a board member of Latin Pacto from Fundacion Grupo One Colombia. Uh, we're also having to, the, to uh, another event um, in the, on October 19th, which is uh, with uh, Dalberg, another ETR mediary. Uh, our CEO, Carolina, will be a panelist together with people from Andes Impact, Alive, and uh, Pomona Impact. So as well, um, if you want to attend this, uh, follow us on our social media or at our webpage. And finally, and I think the most important is save the date for the 25th of our April. It's going to be our first annual conference. The venue is Cartagena. Hope you all can attend. Jessica Roshini, of course you're invited and I hope you can join us. Um, so uh, right now I would like to give the floor to, to Jessica. Uh, so she can explain a little bit about her experience working at MPI in China with corporates. Uh, Jessica, the floor is yours. And I already said hi to my dog. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So um, thank you so much for giving such a great uh, opportunity to share our MPI's experience and also my personal experience when we work with the big uh, companies to launch their social campaigns in the mainland China. And um, also I'd like to say that I always want to pay a visit to Latin America. Actually, I haven't. Uh, got the opportunity, but I'm looking forward to uh, to do that in the future. So, uh, okay, let me just uh, share my screen. So, can you see it? Yes. Okay, okay. So, today I just want to focus on the, uh, the same topic, like how can like uh, organization like us have to cooperate to maximize the impact. So uh, there are three parts of my presentation. The first part, uh, I would like to make a brief introduction of MPI, of course, uh, because we have uh, added some new information. I mean, compared with the report released by ABPN. And also the second part, I'd like to share you uh, three cases, the real cases, like when we work with a co company and with a different level of budget. And then uh, last, uh, at last, I'd like to uh, share three of my personal tips, like when we work with a company, like what would be the most important uh, facts to make them and to, I say, to make the donation. Because my job actually, um, even though my title is a brand partnership development, but uh, I'm more like a fundraising uh, person. So my daily job is to like 80%, even like 85% of my time is to deal with the uh, sales uh, directors and the uh, the different donors. So um, we, I would like to share some of my personal experience with you guys. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so MPI. Uh, so actually the, the, the name of MPI stands for Nonprofit Incubator because uh, it was, when it was founded in 2006, it was the, the first nonprofit incubator in China. So after all the 16 years and now and becomes the one of the largest supporting network for social innovation, community organizations, and of course, to provide the um, CESA plans for the big companies. So uh, I'm not going to go through the all uh, the word by words of our mission and the vision, but if you uh, pay attention, like compare the 20, 2020 version and the 2006 version, and you will find there's a big difference because before we only focus on uh, they empower and incubate the uh, social organizations, but uh, since 2020, we're well, going to think like big because we wanted to, to uh, establish a, you know, a balanced, trustful and co-governance sociality. So 
uh, I, I think this is also because of the um, development of the whole Chinese sociality I mean, in, with the philanthropy industry. So we will actually kind of expand our, our vision. <laughs> and also you can see the network. As we, uh, we headquarters based in Shanghai and we have offices about 19 regional, uh, we have 19 regional offices in almost including all the first and second tier cities, major cities of the mainland China. And uh, actually now I'm here in here, is the uh, here, like Southwest province in Yunnan. And also we have the office here in, in the capital city of Kunming in, of this province. And also uh, we have um, uh, set up project sites in almost six, 16 cities. And uh, uh, also covers about 2,000, more than 2,000 communities. Actually, uh, this gives us um, a good advantage. I mean, a big advantage when we work with the transnational companies because almost all the transnational companies, they want to do the project big. That means they would like to uh, practice in as many cities as possible. So that's why actually they chose us to work together because we have this network. So I think this is kind of an advantage, like a unique advantage because um, compared with other, you know, the small, medium-sized NGOs, uh, we have this, a lot of connections. Uh, okay, and uh, also we uh, have incubated and uh, trained more than 4,000 NGO and uh, search enterprises in the recent years. Uh, okay, and here actually is, um, so MPI now is not only like one single entity, uh, but on this MPI brand umbrella, we have uh, initiated uh, more than 20 different uh, entities, including a social organization, including foundation, and also including um, social enterprises. So now when we uh, talk about MPI, it's not like one single organization, but it's more like, um, it's like, like a group of uh, like, um, NGO and social enterprise and, uh, and uh, foundations. So it's a big family. And uh, um, we actually uh, had, um, we have got this long history to work with uh, uh, companies, but uh, I have to admit that most of our donors are transnational companies. Uh, at the first beginning, it almost takes 90% um, of our donors uh, from the private sector are the transnational companies, but uh, in the recent three years, uh, they are more and more, you know, the local companies, they would like to do something to promote social innovation. So we now actually, we have about maybe 70% of the transnational company and 30% from the local company. And uh, you can see it here is uh, uh, some of the, uh, of our donors. You can see like most of them actually are very reputable, like tra big transnational companies. So um, I can not, I mean, go through all cases. So today I'm going to uh, share with you three cases because when we uh, are discussing like um, a CSR program, a program with a company, uh, except for the, uh, the purpose, the social impact and the, the expectation of the social impact, the very important effects is the budget because sometimes um, I regret to say, the impact sometimes depends on the budget, but it's not always like necessary like this. So I will give you three examples. The first one is um, the one with the sufficient budget. So I'm going to take the case of HSBC. When we say sufficient budget, um, I can not tell the exact number, but uh, annually the budget will more than like, like millions of RMB. And you can see this picture. This is gentleman is the previous, uh, the, the, the global chairman of HSBC. And this um, picture uh, is taken in one of the communities in Shanghai and uh, during his visit to China. And uh, he just visit uh, this community because at that time, MPI and HSBC worked together to launch the largest community partner program uh, across the country. And uh, at last, the, the program actually is bound in more than 20 cities because we have the sufficient budget. So actually um, we just divide this, um, uh, this program into like small pieces. Uh, that means we are trying to engage as many local uh, partners, including the local community organizations and also the uh, 
the residents, as you can see in the picture, to be part of the program. Uh, for example, uh, we use this um, fund to sponsor the more program, community programs in uh, all these 20 cities. And we sponsor a very small community programs initiated by the local resident. So actually, um, I, I don't have exact number at the moment, but uh, let me put it this way. If you use this, the budget, like uh, just by one organization, and, uh, and in another way, we just uh, spend the budget and to sponsor as many as um, uh, small as many as possible the small organizations. Of course, the later will make more uh, social impact. The money can the fund can be very small. I mean, uh, it can be like ten percent of a regular uh, program. I mean, uh, delivered by uh, a normal social organization. Uh, so with this program, we just uh, made a big impact. And uh, back then, this program became the largest community program in the mainland China. Okay, so this is the, the first case. And the second case, so okay, what if you have a like, very limited budget? We want to do something good, but um, according to the company policy, we just don't have that enough money. But, but meanwhile, we still want to make a good impact. So uh, I'd like to share with you the case. We work together with the Landlist. It's an Australia-based company and um, it's still with the, the elderly care of real estate. So uh, last year, after the outbreak of the COVID, just, they just came to us and they said, okay, we want to um, do something for the community, especially for the uh, elderly people in the community, but um, we don't have enough budget. I mean, compared with, compared with the big banks, we don't have enough budget. So what should we do? So we had um, several discussion internally and also with the uh, CSR manager around the land list. And last, we decide to deliver this research program. And, and the, the subject is uh, the research on the community resilience in the post-pandemic era, especially focusing on the needs of the old people in the community. So we select it because of the limit of the budget, we can only do this program within Shanghai, not nationwide, but uh, we just select six uh, very typical communities with a large population of the elderly people. And uh, we, we did research and we sent the package, as you can see the first, the first picture. We sent the package at first. Uh, it, it's in, just included like, like necessary food and uh, healthcare products. And so as, um, as a courtesy, and uh, when we just paid the first visit to the community and just donate, just make a small donation, uh, to the uh, vulnerable group within the community, so which actually uh, give us a very good access to these communities. And then we just um, uh, did the interview, as you can see the picture, we did the interview within all these six uh, communities. Uh, we sent the questionnaires and on what uh, are they need uh, and uh, in the post pandemic era and uh, uh, what will be the fact they think the most uh, is of the most important to make a community of a resilience. So uh, it's actually a very intensive and a very unique report because back then, you know, almost all the donors, they just uh, chose to spend money to uh, support the wonderful groups. Um, but not many actually, they did this such kind of research. So it's very unique and uh, uh, after the we finished this report and we just released the report and uh, also we sent this report to the local authority and the other uh, company partners who actually um, also are interested in the community issues. So that makes actually a big impact, especially comparing the, the limited budget. Okay, and also there's a very uh, unique case. So when we actually have zero budget, that means the company did at the moment, they cannot give any fund, I mean, the real money uh, to us, but they would like to do something to um, uh, make a social impact and they want to do, but they have to add you know, other resources such as uh, personnel. So this is a very interesting case. Um, we work with the IHG Shanghai, it's uh, you know, the hotel group or most of the, uh, hotels, five-star hotels. So uh, since last year, just uh, we uh, have launched, I guess, five or six 
uh, activities like this. We bring actually the five-star chef from the different hotel and bring them into the uh, local communities, uh, communities of Shanghai. But, and also we chose the special date. As you can see, this picture is actually, um, it's a women's day, the women's day. So actually we, we, we just uh, uh, have the chef, the, uh, the made uh, dessert. And uh, also you can see this one, no, just, just a moment. This one uh, is actually, we did this on the neighbor, uh, I think the neighbor's day. So actually they made the food and sent to the food to the Canadian workers of the communities. And this is one of the senior uh, manager from HG. And so such kinds of activities is uh, very interesting and is very attractive to the local communities. And also we actually, um, didn't expect that the media can be such interested in such topic. So uh, we didn't actually do some promotion like uh, on purpose, but after all these activities, we can find like one or two pieces like uh, news just uh, uh, on the local media. So actually it makes them, I mean, the people, the, the our friend from actually are very happy about it. So this is a very, um, unique example, like when you are a donor, they don't really have this uh, uh, budget in cash, but we can borrow the other resources from them, such as the, the personnel and the knowledge, the network, the information. So I think uh, this is also um, uh, most uh, frequently used uh, solution when we work with the uh, big companies. And also another examples, uh, when we work with the tech companies such as IBM, SAP, so we always use this kind of uh, exchange of the resources. No fund, no cash, but you know the knowledge and other tools. So I think also this is a, a very how say like flexible to uh, work with these uh, big donors. And uh, okay, so at last I'd like to share that uh, three of my personal tips when we work with these uh, big companies. So the first one is always assess corporate to adopt better localized CFS strategy because um, I believe most of the uh, company, they spend money and they would like to launch a CFS strategy. The, the purpose is to, uh, of course, first they want to do something good, right? And then they want to uh, establish a very good, how to say, the reputable image, brand image, and uh, they want the people like them. And also they want the government like them to uh, prove that actually they have the face in the market and uh, the sociality. So we have to, we need to help them to understand the trend and the policy and what the government would like the most and what the people like most. And then we'll help them to um, just uh, adjust the strategy accordingly. So I also take this case um, of we work with the HSBC because to be honest, it is still at the moment, it's still uh, one of our largest donors and the partnership uh, lasted about eight years, I guess. So uh, as I mentioned before, at the first beginning, we worked together on this um, uh, community partner program. But after three years, HSBC they, uh, actually they, uh, just uh, update their strategy a little bit and they came to us to let's do something more innovative. So we just um, did a lot of the research and then we came up with this idea. So, okay, let's just uh, support the development of a local social enterprises because this, this uh, concept is quite new in China and uh, only like, I guess, first it in the like, recent three years, almost uh, the most five years. So it's quite new and not many other donors paid attention uh, on this uh, area and uh, it's a good opportunity to uh, encourage the innovation. So they like the idea. So we, we then we just um, released a new program, uh, I guess three, two, two or three years ago, I think starting in 2019, which is called uh, the most investment, uh, investment worthy social enterprise top 20 in China. So every year we just uh, selected and we trained and uh, we uh, funded. 20 social organizations, uh, social enterprises in, in China. So this is a uh, like update, uh, uh, it's a new, a brand new program we worked with HSBC. And then as you may know, you know, go with the new media, the TikTok and the WeChat video and becomes very popular. 
uh, in China and lots of uh, company, they use that tour to uh, do the marketing, to uh, make, you know, huge, uh, they, they would like to use the tool to make huge so, uh, impact. So also we borrow this concept and we use this new media uh, into the uh, promotion of our CSR programs. So also you can see this picture, this is some um, uh, campaign we did for HSBC. And uh, uh, the video actually gets very popular on internet and uh, they're very happy about it. And also you can see this is a very new uh, policy actually released by uh, the Chinese government, which is called the Rural uh, Revitalization. It's uh, just released in the uh, beginning of this year. So because of this new trend, so we just uh, shared a new idea to, uh, we had a discussion uh, with HSBC say, okay, let's do something uh, together to meet the expectation of the this kind of government policy. And then uh, we start um, a new program this year because it, you, can see, you can see the picture. So we train the farmers, actually they use the new media to sell their products. It's very simple, but it's a, it's a, it's a great recall to this kind of uh, uh, new policy released by the government. So this is a first uh, tip to always just to have them because transnational company, uh, you have to know more like uh, than then on the local issues. And then you can have them to come up, come up with this um, most uh, uh, useful and influential CSS uh, strategy. And the second one is, Jessica, can I interrupt, interrupt you quickly? Can, uh, sure, go ahead. We're, we're, we're a little bit short on, of time, so if you can uh, do the second okay, three sure. tips in, in two or three minutes, that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay, sure. Uh, just give me like two more minutes. I think I can finish. Okay, the second one is just act fast, quite effectively. So uh, you can see the picture. This is uh, the program we work with the DBS. It's also a bank uh, last year, just after the outbreak of the COVID. So it takes about uh, less than a week to uh, just design all programs. And uh, we just uh, uh, really initiated this program and uh, very fast and uh, uh, just practice locally in uh, 12 cities in China and engage a lot of uh, uh, communities and uh, also the uh, staff volunteers. And uh, the last one, I guess, it's like always do not hesitate to provide ad venue service, even if your donor don't have extra budget for that. So we always use the, the make, just, uh, just do our best to use all channels to promote the programs of our donors and uh, to uh, invite them as a guest speaker on our international forums and to showcase the programs uh, on the exhibitions and things like that, uh, yes. So I think our donors will be very happy about that. So I guess that's all about my presentation and uh, apologies for the time because I didn't actually notice the, yeah, it's, it's just too fast, okay. So that's the end. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jessica. And I think what, what you shared is, is really important and I hope the, 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 person, the people who are attending can, can get this, can start using these three tips. Um, and I really like that, uh, that you understand that when organizations start seeing beyond uh, uh, the concept of financial capital towards a more inclusive way of, of seeing capital such as human or intellectual or even technological, the opportunities uh, to achieve impact increase. So uh, because sometimes even limited budgets can give way to use human capital in innovative ways, uh, just as you showed. Uh, so that's that's pretty much it. And right now we would like to open the the floor to to some questions. I'm not sure if anyone wants to. You can write them on the chat, and I can read them, or you can of course open your microphone and do the question your own. Ask the question your own. Yeah, I think Carolina. Gracias, Juan. Thank you, Juan. And, and thank you, Roshini, Jessica, and David for the presentation. Um, David, 
you from Mexico, how do you see this proposal from Asia and how do you see what Jessica uh, introduces to us? I think I want to see your vision here in Latin America and from ARCA being a multi-Latina company. How do you see this model here? Thanks, Carol. And, you, and well, also a second question. You as a yes. founder of Latin Impacto, how do you see that we can promote this kind of models here in our region as well? Thank you, Carol. Uh, I think there is a, there is a clear uh, need and it doesn't matter where geographically you are located, the struggling to create impact is, is uh, similar. There, there is a, maybe some different context uh, with regulation or uh, certain social structures, but at the end, the need to create uh, impact and go beyond um, the company fences out is, uh, is still something that we'll, we'll need if we want to reach a more sustainable future, future for everyone. Uh, so I think those models apply and in a sense, uh, more in intuition, I think it's already happening uh, in Latin America. It's maybe not by design or with a systematic approach uh, most of the time, but it's already happening. You see the companies and the organizations investing in several uh, different ways to create impact um, from, from the internal perspective, but as well with different partnerships uh, with, the, with the other private sector, with the government, uh, with the civil society, and the academia, uh, sometimes uh, with um, platforms or uh, with other vehicles, but at the end, uh, we're moving towards that direction. So what is happening in, in other regions, and especially with what uh, Roshini and Jessica shared, I think is very, um, uh, is, is absolutely applicable and relevant to the Latin American um, context, definitely. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Pablo. Roshini, um, are there any specific characteristics of, of intermediaries that, that you would point out to make them successful? That's a really interesting question, Pablo. Um, I think that for an intermediary to be really successful, the intermediary needs to understand the local context very well. Um, we have a number of intermediaries that are, so like MPI in China, they support banks that are global like DBS, uh, HSBC, Lendlease is an Australian company. And they come into these markets where they want to grow their business, but they also want to show that they contribute back to the community. And that's where, well, that's where MPI has been most successful. There are a lot of other examples um, in the Asian context that are similar. So the first thing is that you have to understand your local context. You have to be able to build that bridge um, to the to to the local social uh, economy and the ecosystem to provide access to partners. I think intermediaries also are very successful when they can help um, larger corporates understand how to define the strategy. And a lot of what David uh, mentioned about where he is with, with ARCA, it's, a, it's quite a common challenge, right? When you are talking to stakeholders within the company, trying to pitch to them a larger issue around water that uh, affects your business in the long term, but may not be directly impacting today. And I think that's where intermediaries also play a big role in providing that context so that you have the right vocabulary, the, the right presentation to make internal and external stakeholders resonate with the cause that you're serving. So I say I think those would be the two. It, it's sort of like a, a simultaneous translator between corporate and anyone public. Yep, to get the exactly. Right. <laughs> yep, that's right. You're so right. Uh, someone else has a question. Uh, I would like to ask uh, David, like, how's been the experience of redefining this the strategy of Arca, uh, both uh, horizontally between the different offices in the different countries and uh, vertically between the from ground people to, to the executive level? Yes, uh, so the experience is um, always challenging because you have um, we're trying to, to do it in, not in a central way, uh, not from the corporate to specifically every location, but in the other way around, bottom up, 
understanding first the reality geographically uh, of the challenges that we are facing, and uh, uh, and then try to develop something that is made to measure to that reality. And and the the um, it's it's a uh, going back to Roshini question um, as we in, in Pablo question is the translation is is something that is key internally uh, because again you show this kind of of uh, needs to invest uh, on on certain topics that at the beginning if is not very well explained it looks like it's very far from your core business so the connection and and something that has been very useful for us has been uh, not only the narrative but as well how to um, link the financial impact to the company. Uh, sometimes it could be a little bit tricky or complex, but at the end, if you have the right assumptions, the right information, you can make the case and build a case from the, the um, um, from a more uh, broad perspective of some issue as water or emission, whatever is the topic, and connect that to the to the um, um, to the business something that is going to be key at the end and that's why i think this uh, backbone or organization on, or the inter intermediary is so important is the the um, uh, feasibility of this kind of investment could be more clear when you are working collectively and in another way if you invest alone in one of these kind of projects it's very difficult to reach the scale and probably the internal uh, return of investment but when you see the the organization moving a whole organization with several actors moving in the same direction that is going to enable your business case so i think it's a it's a, um, a challenge on the narrative on the technical understanding but as well uh, connecting the financial impact to the core business. That's great. Thank you very much for the, for the clear explanation. Uh, and just uh, one small question as well for, for both Jessica and David. Um, David, in your, in your presentation, you said that you were going from, from identifying and working in, in symptoms to identifying and working on root causes. How's the process of going from identifying a symptom to the root cause, to identify the root cause? It's a, it's a very, as well, interesting um, uh, effort to, to identify these root causes because you need help. Uh, sometimes you, you are just uh, completely biased by your internal information, but you need other perspectives as well. So that is uh, one thing that I will suggest have uh, as many perspectives about 360 view on the topic that you are trying to to face and the other thing requires just stepping back and asking um why is this happening so if if i have a a specific um uh, uh, a specific risk of challenge and then step back and see try to see the full picture and do that again and that again at some point you are going to realize that um this is something that is more complex than just a simple initiative or program. It will depend the depth on the on the topic, but at certain level you will see the the, the full picture. And with the help of other perspectives, uh, it's going to easy then identify what are the the root causes uh, of the challenge that you are facing. And 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 again going back, water is a is a very easy case to to explain because. Um, you start internally with with efficiency radio radius and in other kind of of kpis but at the end you are having the pressure or having um the the risk of at some point being a, a difficult situation for the climate or uh because the the demand of water is is going up so at some point you realize that the problem is not exactly or the challenge is not just trying to invest on, on be more efficient or having uh, a more, another sustainable practice, but to understand what the system needs to be sustainable and reliable. And you, you start identifying topics that are, again, looks a little bit far from the conversation internally as water governance or how we decide as a society where to invest. When you can see that picture, it's more clear where you need to invest to solve a specific problem, or at least contribute uh, from from your perspective. But the collective action is going to be needed. Um, so that's that's the, the idea. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, and just, I think, a final question, if no one else has one. Uh, Roshini, this one, uh, one of the of the of the key issues you identified on, on CSR is that there's a bias towards helping larger NGOs instead of uh, smaller NGOs that might have more knowledge of the field or can achieve more impact. How can what 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 for example what uh, kind of recommendations can you give to a corporate in order to find these smaller NGOs to to work with? Work with an intermediary, of course. <laughs> um, that's the answer, because the intermediary has that long track record, it has the reputation, it has demonstrable impact. What an intermediary can do is bring together these small nonprofits, um, put them through a program, incubate them, um, and then the successful ones will go on to be in a position that can be that allow them to be funded directly. Uh, right. So if you work with an intermediary, you are actually providing the support to the smaller nonprofits through an established organization. I think you totally agree. Right, Jessica? <laughs> <laughs> OK, yes, exactly. That is actually what we did uh, with uh, work on the HSBC program. So we just sponsored this more community organizations. Yes, that's amazing. Yeah. Formation and and of, of the of the local smaller NGOs. Yes, and actually, uh, we have uh, two types of the uh, small uh, community organizations. The first one is like officially registered. We call it, as I, as I said, it's local NGOs, and uh, uh, there's a new concept which is raised in the recent years, which is called a KOL. That means the you know the key opinion key opinion leader in the community. So it's, it can be just a normal like a residents who live in this community. They don't have any like uh, officially registered organization, but uh, only a group of people who just love the community and who want to do something for this community. And uh, we can also take them as a small community organizations and, and they can actually uh, get a small funding from uh, certain programs from us. Amazing, yeah. I, I think my question got to its point. <laughs> um, so I think that's pretty much it for today. Uh, thank you very much, David, Roshini, and Jessica. Jessica, I hope you can uh, keep enjoying your holidays. And Roshini, I hope you have a really great night. Uh, thank you, everyone who assisted. And please remember that you can download the translations of the report with the case study of MPI at our web page. Thank, thank you so much. For everything. Thank you very Thank much. You. Have a nice one. Thank you.